This is the Wait We Elementary School Committee meeting for March, um, starting at four o'clock. First thing, uh, calling the meeting toward at four o'clock. And do I have a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting of February 9th? Yes, I'll move to approve the minutes from February 9th. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Yes. Warren, yes. And now we're on to the financial statement. Uh, Warren, Darius, do you have a summary? And Shelly won't be here. I don't. So Shelly's, um, as we know, Shelly, is, uh, his mother has passed and um, yesterday morning. So I think she was going to get me stuff kind of last minute. Um, but... Um, yep. The conditioner might have caused her to be away all weekend and such as well. So, um, so I don't have I don't have much information on that. And when we go into the budget proposal again, I'm going to have limited information there. Um, I'll take any feedback back. But our kind of our next step is to meet with. You know, I'm jumping ahead, but I'll, I'll get to that when we when we get to that. So I don't have that, but I'll have okay. her send it out. Any update we she has um, out to you. Okay. Um, there was no public comment as far as I know. No. So, um, Kelsey's not on yet for the anti-racism update, so we can get back to that when she hops on. So that brings us to the COVID-19 update. Yep. I'm just trying to pull my note, my meeting notes up in one second. Um, basically, it's you know, COVID um, numbers are are behaving right now, which is good. Um, we have started our second week of pool testing, and um, Wheatley has right now currently 54% uh, participation, 89% from staff, 45 from students. Um, and so we've had kind of a successful first two weeks there. The commissioner came out last week and announced that he's extended the um, the free window of testing until April 18th, so right up to April break. So that's so it's going to be six total weeks. Um, so that's a good news as well. So um, we'll be able to do that longer before having to make a decision. Um, I think that short window would have been tough for us to figure out how to proceed forward. Um, Anyway, you're so you're saying he extended it and it'll be six weeks? I thought so it, was yes. supposed, it was supposed to be six or seven to begin with, wasn't it? It was supposed to be six to begin with, but then remember they didn't give us the codes in time yep. to get it going prior to break. Um, and then um, we had some issues the week after break, getting everybody signed up. So it took, a, it took some weeks to get us going. But um, So that was the six windows and then six weeks, and now they've extended it to vacation. Okay. Before it's, we have to contract ourselves for cost. The um, the testing for that, does that get sent out or do we do it, the actual tests on the sample? We do not. So we do the swabbing, the mm -hmm. nose swab, and then we package it up and a courier picks it up and brings it to the testing facility, picks up from all our locations here and other schools that are doing it in the area, and then drives it out to Boston, I believe, or the Boston area. And then, you know, we found out we had yesterday's results this morning. So a pretty quick turnaround. And Waitley's been was clean this week as well. Good. Right, Chrissy? Unless I didn't hear anything, right? <laughs> no, we um we did ours today. Well, you did yours today? Yeah. All right, um, so those... Yeah. And they they went out. I don't know, sometime early afternoon. Last week, we had them back by the next day. So, yeah. pretty quick turnaround. They had said, I think, two to three days. So, that's pretty good. And it's not, if I understand correctly, not everybody who signed up will be tested every week. It will be a select, like it'll rotate. No? Right now, everybody who signs up is being tested. And oh. so, the idea, the idea was if, if when we go to pay for it ourselves, we'll make that decision whether or not, yep. how we want to continue doing it. Do we want to do select groups? Do we want to rotate groups? Do we want to do everybody? You know, we'll, we'll just look at the cost mm -hmm. and, then, and then make some decisions in how effective it is or helpful it is. Okay. Did the case, um, 
the one case that we did have in Waitley recently, did that come from pool testing or was that just someone having symptoms? Chrissy, you want to, you were from my Yeah, that, that was coincidental, the timing of it, because it okay. kind of looked, it kind of looked like we had gotten it from pool testing, but um, the person in question had not participated on, on that day. So it was just, it was just coincidence. So that's really it on the COVID update. There's really um, what's going on there. Um, I could jump in. Uh, I'll go off my some of the stuffs in my report. I'll just do it now. Um, the commissioner came out last week. Those of you who didn't see the paper, basically came out and made a public announcement that he is going to the Board of Education um, and asking for all schools leave the hybrid model um, pre-K to pre-K pre-K to five, I think, or pre-K to six, um, depending on the model of the districts, um, starting April. April, now I think it's April 5th. So that'd be the first um, first Monday in April. Um, so basically how that works is, so the commissioner, much like our setup, has the, there's the commissioner, like my, would be like myself, and then there's a board of education that has, um, you know, constituents from different parts of the state and so on and so forth. So he's basically telling them I'm, I'm requesting the permission that to give me the authority to require schools to come back for time on learning purposes. And so what that means is <clears throat> it would force us um, to go to five days a week starting April 5th. Now they, they can say, what about local control? Well, you still have local control. You don't have to listen to the state, but the state will not count any hybrid remote learning hybrid remote, so hybrid slash remote learning as time on learning. So that time won't count. So those Wednesdays wouldn't count, so we'd have to make those up in June. So essentially he's forcing the hand of, um, of schools to move back to either in-person or be completely remote. So our completely remote students could stay completely remote, but our hybrid students will be back for all, um, for all five days a week moving forward at that point. I found out today I was on a, a legal call, as you know, talking about the legal implications of all this. Um, that they're probably going to meet on it hasn't been posted yet, but they're going to probably meet on Friday. So we'll know as early as on Friday. Um, then with guidance following early next week on what the decision means. But it's not a huge change for us in the sense of you know structurally, um, you know, making the kids you know the kids who are 40s a week to now go back on the Wednesdays. Um, you know, it'll disrupt in how some of the stuff that we do internally, but they'll not, it won't put things upside down, so to speak. Like, how are we going to do it? There's a lot of schools out there that are doing half days, um, a couple days a week, or even less. And so he's really, I believe, the commissioner's push is trying to get schools as normal as possible before, before January so that September can be a normal opening. <clears throat> Before, so, before June, you mean? For June, so that September can be a normal yeah. reopening of the year. Um, there are some, you know, there are districts, as even locally, you've probably seen the paper, um, who are not open yet, and you know, they their their unions are fighting not to go back this year. And so I think it's pushing there because some of them are trying to maybe even possibly carry into next year, whatever that looks like. And I think that's part of the some of the politically how it's politically putting across Massachusetts, understanding there's a lot of other moving parts um, of different districts that are in much different setups and legal issues as well, where we are not. Right, it just seems kind of strange to mandate that when teachers may not even be vaccinated yet. Yep, uh, it says clearly in that, um, the thing that I think I sent to all of you out his uh, posting, it clearly states that the vaccination is not a prerequisite to going back five days a week. So, um, you know, I think that's the, uh, for us, again, we can do it right now without changing much safety levels not, or changing things at all safety-wise what we're doing for spacing, PPEs, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, with the warmer weather coming as early as next week, and if you looked ahead, we've got some days that are going to be in the 50s next week. Um, you know, we're going to have, you know, more access to the outdoors, and um, we've kind of reset the the toughest stretch I think already. Um, so, you know, 
I, I hear what you said, Maureen. I thought the I thought the play was that he was putting it out there, and then he would counter with May first. You know what I mean? You know that, that like you, you know, any negotiations, okay. any negotiations, you kind of put a, a higher, you know, you put the your ridiculous price on the table and you see where it goes. So maybe that will we'll see what the board says. The board could have say no, we want you to push it. I'm sure the MTA is talking to their to the board because um, that would be there. Um, MESC is also pushed back a little bit. Um, that's your committee statewide to say, you know, we want guidance and help on that. Um, so we'll see what happens with that vote. Yeah, I mean, it's not so bad for our school, but, you know, other cities that are already overcrowded and it just seems a little strange. So they, yeah, they will be coming back out with, um, so one of the big things is right now, Desi's guidance on spacing is three to six feet separation, you know, minimum of three. We did a minimum of six. The CDC came out with guidelines um, right now as well as, you know, keeping it at six feet. So Massachusetts is now countering and there's a letter out there. Um, I believe I shared it as part of that um, pack that I sent out a letter from pedi uh, pediatricians and doctors across Massachusetts. Um, now, I guess there's over 300 doctors and uh, medical professionals have signed on to that, um, or me, just doctors, I want to say medical professionals, because that could be a wide range, um, signing on that, you know, three feet is an acceptable distance, and they're not seeing indications that um, the difference between three and six feet makes that much of a difference. So, however, you know, people are saying they're, they're you know, painting a picture that they want to have in order to reopen schools. Um, on the flip side, you know, the CDC is making recommendations for a nation that has very different looking schools than Massachusetts and men are PPEs and in, in, in other kind of practice. I mean, Florida, they're pretty much all back in and they're barely being masked down there. Um, so you're kind of looking at different cultural, state culture, I'm kind of saying, um, you know, interpretation of what masking should be and that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, Massachusetts is a, you know, there's a part of me that believes that since we are the number one medical state in the country that our medical professionals should be the best, but we are going to have to have that conversation um, if all the students who are remote all of a sudden all wanna come back because we won't be able to do it at a max of six feet. We could definitely, I think we can definitely do it at three feet. Um, some schools are saying they can't do it at three feet. So you can imagine the overcrowding in some of those schools. Um, so, you know, we'll be back talking about, um, we'll see what the, the statement is coming out for Desi and then what, what we have to do on our end there. Now, I was looking online because I saw that K through 12 staff are the, in the next group to be vaccinated, but I couldn't find out when, I couldn't see when that was. Do you know when that is? I, I know there's some vague. Right now, it's, so there's, there's a lot of rumor and that kind of stuff out there because what's going on right now is that the leadership of, uh, you know, boards of health and the people assigned to help set vaccination clinics are trying to set up facilities, are talking about setting up facilities just for teachers, much like Connecticut did. They did teachers only facilities to move that process along quicker to get their students back and, you know, make that a priority after the 65 um, year olds were done. Um, so they are having those conversations now. I'm not part of those conversations. I'm CC'd on a few of the emails regarding, you know, they're having the conversations and they're going to let me know when they have kind of a plan. Same time, you know, Massachusetts, I don't realize Massachusetts is, is, is over twice the size of Connecticut um, population wise. So, um, you know, they're a little bit ahead of us also due to the numbers and number of vaccines they got. So, um, you know, it's all about supply and demand, you know, so if they can get us more supply, um, you know, we can, you know, set those things up. So hopefully that's going to be the case in the morning in the next few weeks that we're going to see them announcing that they're going to do a Franklin County teachers, blah, blah, blah. And then they'll, we would provide information of who our teachers are, sign ups, kind of that kind of stuff. I do know that the local, like Kringle Candle did a, I think they were doing theirs this week um, as another site that was, but they did only, they were trying to do only local signups. And then it, that one was on, actually, I think that one ended up being a state signup, but they're trying to make it so that the state that sticks with local, they don't go on the state server and have the overload problems they had from um, what's going on. There's, um, I, believe it or not, people are setting up computer programs that are automatically filling the, the lists and that kind of stuff. I don't know. Um, 
how you know you build it you know those kind of people will come and hurt it kind of deal so um and anyway. i have another question um when when the staff does get vaccinated are we expecting um everybody to be in person all the teachers and staff to be in person or it's a good question so um I, I have kind of basically communicated with the staff. You know, I was saying this prior to the the uh, you know uh, uh, Jeff Riley's um, you know saying about coming back in April that the next big large movement, especially we're talking about elementary here, is going from four days a week to five days a week will happen after the vaccination of the teachers. And so I've kind of said I don't I was not looking to make a change in any structural thing until the vaccinations happen. Again, when I originally made that statement, also. And it was also, um, we were hoping vaccinations were gonna start in February. Um, but I still am not gonna, I'm not gonna pivot just because those things got, got delayed. Um, so what would happen after that point, how I see it happening, I'd have to run it by legal and stuff because of whatever, of all the kind of things there, but the conditions have changed of any leaves. If someone is out for medical reasons related to COVID, they would have to provide new documentation um, from the doctor that says even with the vaccination, they're no longer, and that's gonna get, that goes down a whole nother avenue that if they're no longer, they can't come back even after vaccination, the question with the, us as employers are going to be in a position of, well, the position you were hired for is an in-person position. And, you know, we're going to have to figure that out on an individual basis. And hopefully that um, will not have to be the case for anybody. Um, but <clears throat> again, but you have to remember it's six weeks after the last person gets vaccinated or is able to get vaccinated. So, it is still a long stretch because it's you need <clears throat> four weeks between shots if they're doing the if we're doing the Madeira, which is the one that's been available to us recently, um, and you need two weeks after the last shot in order to be considered um, safe. So um, I have to kind of I'm going to have to do a kind of a model that says you have the opportunity to sign up from a test, and you chose not to. It's not when the first test rolls out. It's going to be when. Um, you know, so that's why I really also want to hope that we have a, a regional educators only so that we can control and it's not a free for all where everybody's fighting over slots. And then people say, like, I keep getting bumped. I really am trying. And then there's like, are you really trying or no, I'm not trying. You know, you, you know, you aren't, you're not trying hard enough. You know, I want to be able to say, like, you were given a slot. You chose not to you chose not to have the thing. So therefore, you know, I can send you. A letter. I don't think that's going to be the case, but I'm just saying we have to look at it as, you know, um, making sure they have the, the, um, the yeah, I mean, it still could be a while before we get to six weeks after the last staff member, so. Yeah, um, exactly. So Kelsey has jumped on too. If you want to jump. Yeah, Kelsey's on. So um, I didn't have any more questions about that. If I don't know if anyone else does. If you don't, we could get um, to Kelsey's summary. Hi, Kelsey. Hey, nice to see you all. Um, so for the Anti-Racism and Equity Committee, we just had two pretty big meetings recently, um, one on Thursday and then a follow-up meeting on Monday, um, kind of talking about where are we so far in the year? What's worked well? What are the challenges? What do we need? Um, and what are the next steps? Um, and sort of the theme that kept coming up was communication, that we really need um, clearer communication in between subcommittees, um, in between schools, even in between teachers, and especially between um, the school and the community, that the community really doesn't know a lot of what we've done um, and a lot of what's going on. Um, so we want to find ways to really make it more um, more public facing. So that, I mean, this is something that we should be proud of and excited of, excited about that we're doing, and we want to share it with the with the community. Um, so we're looking at doing a monthly newsletter, um, which we currently have. Uh, one of our juniors is heading that up um, with some support um, because we have students who are on each of the four subcommittees. So they're able to report out kind of what's going on um, and give us kind of the student perspective of what's happening in the school. And then that would go out to um, all of the schools and also all of our families so that everyone is kind of in the loop um, about what we're doing. Um, we are also looking at 
ways that our policy and procedure subcommittee can um, can support this work moving forward in terms of creating policies um, for when an incident happens, how do we respond and what's what's the protocol and kind of creating, um, almost creating a playbook for us because we know that as we keep moving forward in this, you know, we're going to have pushback, we're going to have mistakes, things are going to happen. Um, and it would be really helpful to have clear clear policies and procedure, just like we do for bullying, just like we do for, for a lot of other things that go on in school, um, so that we really can respond quickly um, and in an, in an appropriate way. Um, and part of that is really making sure that in all of our responses, we are centering our students and families of color um, and really making sure that the focus is on reassuring and supporting them um, and reaffirming that like, yes, this is your community too. Um, and you are safe and wanted here. Um, and we know that anytime we are focusing on the most vulnerable population, whether it's students with disabilities um, or whether it's having a gender neutral bathroom, like anytime we're supporting those students, everybody benefits. Because really what we're doing at the end of the day is creating a community where the message is, we care about each other, we take care of each other, we support each other. Um, and that makes everybody feel more welcome and more accepted regardless of identity. Um, the other big thing that's coming up for us is PD. So the elementary school professional development this year was phenomenal and continues to be phenomenal. Um, the elementary school teachers are really excited about it. They feel united, they feel energized. Um, we just got really, really positive feedback from that PD model. Um, so we are working on the proposal that you all will be seeing in, in April. Um, so our professional development and curriculum subcommittees have actually merged um, since those two things are, are kind of interconnected at this point. Um, and that will be our next step for them is coming up with that plan for next year and really setting us up for, all right, what's the plan for next year? What's the plan for the next three years? Where do we wanna be? How do we wanna get there? Um, and I think, that kind of brings everybody up to speed. Um, I did want to mention that we're also looking, um, as we're starting to think about long-term goals, we're also thinking about um, the fact that we are the Anti-Racism and Equity Committee, um, and that this really is intersectional work, um, that you know, sexism and homophobia and ableism didn't just magically disappear overnight. Those are still, they're, those are still alive and well. Um, and that part of the role of this committee is also addressing those concerns. And as we're looking through our curriculum, you know, it doesn't make really, it doesn't make sense to really do a deep dive on our curriculum and look at one thing, and then in a couple more years we'll do a deep dive and look at another thing. Like if we're looking at it, let's look at everything, and let's look at all right, where is our our voices of color? How is the, how well are they represented? Where are our students with disabilities? How well are they represented? And just kind of um, look at diversity and inclusion on a larger scale through this anti-racist lens that we're developing. That sounds fantastic. I, I like how you're including the other groups too. And the newsletter sounds like a really good idea because if you don't watch the school committee meeting, you might not know about any, any of this. Exactly. And, um, I, don't, I don't know if we get a lot of views. So <laughs> I like I like communication, so that's great. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kelsey. Always a pleasure to be here. Bye. See you around, Kelsey. Bye. Now, Bye. Bye. <clears throat> okay, so the budget proposal review. Um, I, I'm not sure. So I, I guess the next thing would be the the finance committee meeting. So we, we are scheduled to go to the finance, to talk with the finance committee on the 23rd. Um, so everybody, let me double check, make sure I got that correct before I just go off memory here. On the 23rd at six o'clock. So we'll, we'll meet with them and go through where we're at. We left that last meeting where Shelly was going to come back with a draft, um, getting it a little bit closer to two and a half. You asked her to shift those things around, and I know she did that. I don't have a copy of that draft, um, so um, but it, it was just shifting the Essler money and that kind of thing where we can put it there. So 
you know, outside of that, the, the shifting of those funds to bring those numbers down a couple, a couple more ticks of a point um, to get us closer to two and a half. Um, you know, we can do that. It, it all depends on how much. Basically, we're shifting either from school choice or how much Essler two money we're going to spend in this particular year to reach that number. And so that'll be, you know, I think we'll be transparent about that, talking with the, with FinCom and with the with the select board, and just basically say, you know, this is how we're balancing things out, and see if they agree on that approach as well. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I remind everybody, it's it's your budget. You get to ask for what you want and kind of say what you want. They get to get their recommendations, but you're in charge of this. So um, I think this is a very easy year for me to be saying that because our number is very low and we're not asking for, we're not asking for a lot, but, um, <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of where we're at. There wasn't a whole lot to talk about today's budget. Anyways, you're, you're, you know, Waitley's in good shape. Um, I was on a commissioner call last week as well. That same one I was talking about earlier. He talked about a lot of stuff. Um, there is talk of another stimulus package coming. Um, not that we should be waiting for it any way, but that could also, again, help us with any other kind of things coming down. We'll see how, um, we'll see what the, we'll see what that is when it comes. Okay. Um, so, um, I'd, I'd seen an email Darius from Brian, um, asking for the operating budget for fiscal year 22. So do you know if he received that or will it wait until so, we meet the finance committee? So I will send, we will send them their the information prior to the meeting. <laughs> he sends that to all department heads. We're the only department with, um, a, its own committee. So, um, as I think about, well, I guess not really. With we're only the only committee with this has millions of dollars worth of spending in, in budget hearings and public hearings and such on budget. So he, that, when you read that, I remember my first year getting that. I was like, what? You know, I can't do that. That's not, that's not how this operates. He's like, no, no, it goes to every department heads and, and kind of communication. So we will send our overall budget, and Shelly will do a kind of a narrative summary about what, what's going on in our budget, basically taking what we've already discussed and trimming down the stuff that we don't need to share because we've already discussed it um, with the select board. And we'll give that to them prior to that meeting. So that's kind of basically how that, that works. And if they need anything else, Brian, and I have a very good relationship. He'll pick up the phone and call me or Shelly on that. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Um. I'm sorry, Darius. Did you? What were you saying before about the ESSER fund? That you, you said that Shelley incorporated that after our discussion last time. But did you say if we know if we're what we're getting for sure from that fund? Yes, I do. I do actually know that. Let okay. me let me look, look it up real quick. Waitley's getting thirty-eight thousand eight hundred and fifty-eight. Wow! And so it was when you know, we talked about using some of that money to, you know, reduce that, reduce that by a it was about a percentage and a half, I think, in our last discussion. If I go back into it, we we came in to. We were at three point seven. Um, you know, and so we talked about that. We could use that money to make the rest of the way. That percentage yeah. and a half. That that'll use up if we use the for that way the early childhood wage. It'll use up a lot of that. Do we? Is is that okay? So that's kind of so. I have a double a, a kind of concern, and Shelly and I, um, and as you know, with Shelly's you know Shelly's um, family condition and stuff, it's we've been kind of back and forth. Um, but the um, my concern is that you can you can use that Essler two money all the way through um, September of twenty three. September of twenty three. So yeah, so another full. Uh, so we can save it for next year's um, budget cycle as well. The question is, it, it has to qualify for COVID, and so the question is, if COVID gets like we take care of that, we may not have funds that will connect to it. So I want to make sure we spend some of that money in case we don't get ourselves trapped there. Um, and also new funding might come out as well. So I think it's a balance of not using all of it, but using some of it, because we could also use choice and to offset as well. Um, and I guess that's the conversation. Shelly will have the exact numbers when we have the conversation with um, 
the finance and select board. I mean, we can basically just kind of say like, we can shift these percentages up and down depending on what the, the town can, can, you know, match. And I don't know what's going on in the other departments in the town. You know I mean, do they need schools to be lower? Frontier is, is um, it's important you guys understand this because sometimes people like to package our schools um, together, like how much do the schools cost? But Wheatley's share to Frontier is negative 64,000. So basically we're paying Wheatley people to come to Frontier. Um, not true, if you're watching at home, not true, that was a joke. Um, so, but it's because of the way the assessment rolls and it, we do have these ups and downs because of the way the assessment, the enrollment and that kind of thing, you know, it, it's coming way down. So they actually, the overall growth of the schools based on what we're putting forward actually will be less than last year. So it's kind of a year where, you know, now that we know those kind of assessment numbers, we, you know, question is, do you go at two and a half percent or do you go slightly, you go slightly higher, and this is where we talk to the finance committee, because that's the year where we keep maybe more of our savings. But I also don't know what the other departments in the town need. You know, are we due for a new plow, or are we new for a new ambulance, or you know, that doesn't really count. Fire truck, you know, those kind of things. I don't know what the other needs of the towns are. So that's where we kind of come together on that. It's a good year for us to have a high budget, but. We don't have because we got if we didn't have the ESSER funding, ESSER two funding, we would have a high budget. And the uh, the town could also have some of that money, right? Isn't isn't that what Shelly said last month? Yes, they can. They can go for um, they can take. I believe it's twenty five percent of um, the money. They can elect to take some of the, of the ESSER two money. Um, Again, that's what Shelly was talking about. Okay. So it's half a dozen one or the other. They take the answer to money, our budget's higher. They don't take the answer to money, our budget's lower, and we give them a lower assessment. So either way, they could, you know what I mean? That kind of, you know what I mean? So that's where it's kind of like we're working together, but, you know, it's one of those, <laughs> the same pots of money in such a small town, you know? Okay. And even medium sized though. Okay. Um, anyone else have any more questions on that? So now we're into new business school choice vote. Can you refresh my memory on what that vote is for? And so each each year we are by uh, by law um, have to designate whether or not we are going to participate in receiving school choice students. So once you're kind of involved with school choice, this is kind of one of those. Um, one of those things like once you're involved with school choice and you got to remember the east western mass and the cape are the biggest school choice areas in the in the state you know eastern mass is not there's not a whole lot of school choice happening out there so it's not politically it's not one of those things and that's why there's not a lot of tension um legislatively fixing school choice or providing more money in school choice because the majority of the constituents with the voting power aren't affected by school choice but anyway each year the school needs to designate whether or not it's going to be a school choice school Okay, we're not, we're, we're not saying how many students, we're well, just saying yes to school choice. So by statute, you just, the only thing you have to do is say you're going to be a school choice school. What we've done over the years, is we've also talked about looking at the numbers we have in each class in the school, and it's been a time where we've talked about, and in some of those votes, just to be kind of fun, it appeared like you were voting slots in classes. Um, and we've kind of just kind of gone along with that because we've always been working together on that kind of thing. So um, this year, Chrissy, do you have the school choice suggestion? We want to, believe it or not, this year we're going to request for the school committee to give us a lot of flexibility because we don't know what our school choice numbers are. There's going to be a lot of movement this spring as the, as people kind of come out of the you know Groundhog Day, come out of the, come out of the ground and say, what do we want to do for education? Do we want to change districts? And that kind of thing. Um, and each grade level has different challenges from either size, type of students that the teachers are having to work with, um, that take up different levels of resources, and that kind of stuff. Am I right there, Chrissy? What do you, what do you, am I saying it right? Yeah. Um, the difficult part is not knowing what the services are going to be. I, if I fill up a class and they have to depart, end up with. A lack of space for kids. So 
we're trying to sort of read into the um, what's what we're going to be left with. Your video is really, um, is really broken. Is it broken to everybody else too? Yeah, I yeah. can't hear you. Not even my about my dog. Hold on. And we did talk a little bit about school choice numbers last month too. Right. So basically, um, and, we, and we've done this in other years, and they've done this at um, Frontier when I was principal. They just basically say, you know, um, we just pay like more than one at the discretion of the principal. And so basically, you're opening up all cl classes to to choice. We figure out what the openings are, and then we we start doing an enrollment. We do have to be transparent in our process for selection. You can't. Just let people know out there if people are considering goals right we can't go through the papers and go oh this you'll know, be selective in nature um it's got to be kind of a random process unless um there's a sibling there's a sibling clause in there that you if there's a sibling already in the school um they can they get priority um so we would figure out how many with slots are in each school and if there was three people looking for two slots one we maybe try to see if we can get all three in because nobody wants to keep anybody out um but if it's only two we would then have to do a drawing um, you know, with witnesses to those two slots. And that's what we've done in the past too, just like that, that happens behind the scenes. Also, we, uh, also if a teacher has kids that want to be in the same school as the teacher, the mother, they get priority too, correct? We've treated um, family members that work in the building as like siblings. So they get moved. To, and that goes off the old policy before yep. uh, school choice was even Yep. Now you're in a blue room, Chrissy. Are you underwater? <laughs> like you're underwater. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, I'm in a room. I didn't turn I didn't light on, so it's just a day late. Um, we have 18 choice applications right now, which is a larger number than than we've seen in the last couple of years. What'd you say? We have um, 18 right now. 18 applications. Yep. Um, okay. And are those spread evenly across grades, or is it really just for the younger? No, it's it's pretty evenly. Wow. We will be losing two school students as they graduate. Uh, it won't be too challenging to fill. Um, I I told Gracie, Terry that I apologize if you hear my dog barking. <laughs> well, no, it's good, it's, it's not a good connection. We we're having trouble hearing you. You can't hear it all. Um, fifty fifty. Every yeah. few words. It's in and out. Can you move towards where your server is? I'm this, <laughs> and I don't know anything about computers. I just said if you don't get good service, get next to your server or your wherever it is. I think what Chrissy was trying to say, she had a problem with her dog. Let's go through all the details, Chrissy. <laughs> <laughs> we know way too much about each other nowadays. <clears throat> I don't know if it's my dog. I, I can't hear. Yeah, Chrissy, you're just going to have to. Uh, <laughs> just wave. Hold up a sign. So basically, we're looking for a vote. Um, you know, it's for our one or more um, choice students for each class at the discretion of the principal. And we will report back to the committee what those numbers look like um, after when we fill those, when we, when we complete the roster. Does that sound good, Chrissy? So moved. Do I hear a second? Oh, second. Sorry. <laughs> All in favor? Up. Yes. Yes. Maureen, yes. Okay, and now we're on to the reports. Um, I I was at the um, capital. Um, Yep, the Capital Improvement Planning Committee. We had a couple meetings in the last couple weeks um, to review the capital requests submitted for the fiscal year 22. 
and then we have to vote on the priority. They have an A, B, C, A being the higher priority and C the lowest. And for Waitley, we had three items and two of them got voted as a priority B, the carpet and tiles, the carpet replacement in the three classrooms and the reconstruction of the pavement of the driveway. They both got voted as a B and the kitchen oven got voted as a priority A. Um, I don't know if that means they're only looking at priority A. It was my first time on this committee and I guess that that was our job to vote on the priority. So um, see. they also asked for us to think about future needs of the school because they didn't, with the school being 30 years old, they didn't want to be hit hard in one year. And we did say that uh, we do have a list, an ongoing list that I shared some of that with them so that they could have an idea. Um, they did ask for us to prioritize each item for next year. I mean, there there is a bit of a priority level in there, there already, but I think they wanted a little more specific on that. So that's what I have for the capital improvements. Um, I did can, I not, on that? can I piggyback yeah. on that, Maureen? Sure. Correct me if I'm wrong. If we have, and I know we've done it in the past, you know, I know we're talking about getting these carpets replaced with tile in other places. Uh, that we're just trying to replace some carpet or whatever. But I thought it was a one of our priorities was to get rid of all the carpet and have all tile for easier to clean, maintain. Um, is that something that if we have extra money at the end of the year that we could put forth towards those floors? That was my yeah. question as well. Um, because, you know, it, it's maybe a priority for the school, but for the town, it wasn't the highest priority. Um, I know, I, I feel like the first time we had this done, it was done with extra money and not as a capital uh, request, but I could be wrong. And I, I, I did want to ask, um, Shelly may have the information. It wasn't an urgent question, but when I was looking at last month's um, monthly report from Shelly, it looked like there were several items that had either no money out or very little taken out. And I didn't know if that was still going to be spent or if some of that, if there's any of that left over, it could, if it could be used for something like the floor replacement. Yeah. So I can probably answer a couple of those questions. One, we can find out what the priority means. If I was in their shoes and we've kind of done the same thing in some of our list, priority one usually means it's a safety issue or the if unrepaired the it's going to cost the town more money over time which the floor does not constitute that but the oven is could be considered a safety issue and an energy issue and that kind of stuff so they may be saying that's category ones like we absolutely need to do these then we'll go to category two and choose from i can find out from brian but that would be would make sense the way we look at capital improvements is that you have some that you just these are the have tos these are that we want to's, and then you have like coming down the pike and run. I um, do have the definition of their priorities. Oh, okay. So the priority A says projects are considered urgent, high priority projects, which should be done if at all possible. A special effort should be made to find funding for all projects in this group. These projects typically address safety concerns or compliance issues. And priority B is projects are considered high priority projects that should be done as funding becomes available. These projects typically address deterior deteriorated facilities or are scheduled replacements for facilities and or equipment. So the floor plate replacement does sound like a priority B and it, it doesn't mean that they won't do it, but I, d I don't know how they present that um, at the town meeting if they just don't include priority Bs or not. Right. So you're, you're talking about um, use of end of year funds to do any projects that we, that's absolutely something that can be on the table. But what we also try to balance out, so we have our capital 
we have our capital projects of you know fixing you know structures and things and high priced items and then Christy's also going to have some educational stuff so like we wouldn't normally go to the town to say like we want to buy two thousand dollars worth of let's say robotic equipment that you use the grant money donation for the last year let's say you wanted to get another two thousand we would sometimes use in this year money for that kind of thing as well so we kind of will those things get will be on the list with those other things but absolutely we can look at where we are at the end of the year and it's basically all that savings gets rolled into choice is how we do it out there so we'll have more money in choice so in the, in the long run again it either way the town is you know either we use choice for it we go to the town for it or we charge we don't, you know, it, it, it's all, everybody's shared money, is just a different way of governing it. Um, the list for capital improvements, we can improve what Waitley looks like. One of the truths is, is Waitley School is in pretty good shape. In com certainly in comparison to some of the other schools, not only is it held up well, it's been taken care of. It's a little bit newer than some of the other buildings as well, but it, it's, a, it's a good building and, and there's not a lot of big items in the next three years um, that we see on our radar. There's always, you know, unforeseen things. So um, we can kind of make it, we can make the list a little bit stronger. We can prioritize and do all that. Maureen, I think you're absolutely correct. We need to do that. Um, but I just also want to know, it's not like there's a hidden list um, because it really, it's a good, the building that's in good shape and the townspeople should be happy about that. I don't get to say well, that. Well, it was hard because some of the things on the list, I didn't really know what they were. Um, so maybe next year we'll be able to do the walkthrough like they usually do for the capital planning meeting. Um, I'm just, I'm and I know afraid, I'm just afraid if if they classify the floors, we'll say as a B, and we decide they decide not to fund it this year, and we decide not to fund it this year one way or another, and it goes on to a warrant next year, and it gets pushed aside. That's two years or a year and a half of not doing these floors. And I, in, in our case, and Chrissy can correct me if I'm wrong, I thought the floors were one of those really priority things. Not saying that the, the oven's not a priority, but these floors, you know, when we started it, you know, probably four or five years ago with the first floors that we replaced, that was the way we were gonna go. And to keep them clean, you know, lower maintenance, you know, the whole nine, not, you know, doesn't hold germs. So, I mean, I just don't want to get bumped. If, if we don't take care of it this year with extra money or school choice money, and then we get bumped to next year, unless Chris says, well, let's wait another year, then that's fine. I just don't want to get bumped two years in a row because it's classified as a B. Unless well, this we is... This is Unless the second up, year it's getting bumped. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Unless we start ripping up corners and it becomes a trip hazard. There you go, Bob. <laughs> so I see what we do is I say we see what they come out with, you know, and if they don't fund it, then we have a discussion in house. Like, do we want to, maybe we don't do as many classrooms. We do half as many classrooms and we pay for it out of school choice or pay for it out of IE savings from the remainder of this year. If there is savings and have Shelly look at that and make that a summer project, funding it that way, a portion of it. Um, I say, you know, it's one of those things, let's wait and see what they what they come up with. The oven, while it sounds whatever, but the, right now the, the, the door is warped. It's a three-function oven. I don't know what the other two functions are, um, but it only has only one of the functions that's operational. Um, Kathy has to rotate whatever's cooking in the oven because of the air crack, because it can't hold the temperature. So she has to rotate whatever she's cooking halfway through. Um, you know, so there, it is something, it's, it was 1993, Chrissy, nod yes. 93, 91. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. I, I had to develop a workaround. Um, I, the oven is original to the school, so that's 1990. Wow. So, it's, uh, turning high school. We yeah. got our money's worth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that's what the, um, the finance committee was had some questions about it, and I think they just wanted to, to know, like, is this something we should repair? Um, but clearly, if it's 30 years old, it's it's given us good service, um, and Kathy has developed those workarounds. But if we can if we can replace it, that would be great. And and repairing it right now seems like throwing good money after bad. So absolutely, I'm replacing. You know, with that that's a priority A, and that's coming first. And you know, it's probably the biggest expense out of floors versus that. So. 
Um, I think we are asking for a similar amount. Yeah. They're both around 20. <clears throat> Yeah, and there's other kitchen items that might become a bigger priority than the floor also. Because, um, you know, I think everything in the kitchen is probably 30 years old. How soon does that oven get replaced? Is that for next year? So once the town votes to approve the, once they once they vote it, we, we put it, yeah. depending on what it is, either has to either some, once when we put out the bid, but we go out the bid list to find out we will compete for the best price oven because it's industrial oven. So a $20,000 item like that, we make sure that we get three quotes, not bids, three quotes, make sure we get a good priced oven of what we want. And so then most likely it's the summer. Yeah. We have to get installed. I'm sure it's gas, right? We so on and so forth. Install. Yeah. So that would be after the town meeting in June. Mm -hmm. um, That is all I have. So, Chrissy, do you have your report? Yeah, it's um, it's short because I was looking at the calendar. We met three weeks ago, and then one of those three weeks was vacation, so I don't have a whole lot to report. Um, just a little update on our numbers. As of next Monday, we will have 102 hybrid students and 14 fully remote. So. Um, two, more, two more kids have, have chosen to come back. Um, we already talked about full testing, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I, I just I need to thank everyone again, um, the staff, students, and families for their continued hard work and patience. We are asking for so much patience this year and flexibility, and the community at large for all the support we get. We are, believe it or not, coming up on our coronaversary, and it's been it's been a long. It's been a long year. Um, people are exhausted, but they come in every day and they, they do their thing and the kids come in and you honestly would not know that anything has happened if you look at the kids. Aside from the fact that they're wearing masks on their face, they all seem very happy, very well adjusted and um, kind of thrilled to be there. So it's kind of what keeps us going. It keeps us energized to see how happy the kids are. Um, and I would also like to thank Superintendent Modesto and Kim McCarthy and the entire administrative team um, for all the strength and support that they've given over the past year and will continue to do as we are not quite out of the woods just yet. So um, a big thank you to everybody. It's really it's really a big lift to keep this going. And I'm really, really proud of what we've been able to accomplish. Yep, I second that with your thanks to the superintendent and Kim McCarthy and also you. So you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. And, and that's it. First, that's all I got. Uh, I, did, were you, um, bef in our last meeting, you were talking about hiring a sub, another sub for first grade, I think. Um, um, yeah, for I that. I, she will be starting on Thursday. Oh, cool. Yeah, and that will make things a little easier. Um, we've been doing sort of patchwork to make sure everything's covered, but we'll be in better shape when, when she comes in on Thursday. So that's good news. Okay. Darius, did you have anything else? The only other thing I have in my report that I didn't talk about is next month, remember, is a joint committee. And we'll be talking about calendars, um, a lot of stuff that the whole committee has to kind of do to get our meeting calendars, our, what the school calendar would look like, professional development plan, the rollout of, within that professional development plan, what our anti-racism and discrimination um, equity kind of plan, what we look at, what look we're doing for PD on that as well. Um, so a lot of stuff that, you know, the joint meeting was a little more chaotic, but we have to do some of those votes kind of together. So. Um, if we, if there's a need for us to have another meeting, um, the way we kind of said it for April, if this committee needs to meet due to whatever circumstances, we just call one. You always can call a meeting at any time. Um, just have, have a 24 hour notice or 48 hour notice. Um, so, but so next month is just a, is a joint meeting there. There are some public hearings going to have to happen next month. So the whole idea of having less meetings in that month isn't really going to happen, but that's the way it works. <clears throat> Darius, Darius. Go ahead. I, I just, 
I was just going to ask, do you know what the date is of that meeting off the top of your head? If you don't, don't worry about it. The 6th. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Bob. I just, just a, probably a simple question. Since the kids are going to be going back to school five days a week in the near future here, when are we going to go back to in-person school committee meetings? Miss the it's, coffee and muffins. The, well, um, <laughs> so basically, um, that's up to your that's up to your it's your body's decision to do that. So okay. um, the only difference is that we would do is so we we uh, Deerfield took a whack at this at in December. They tried to do uh, we had the meeting at Frontier for technology reasons. Um, the issue is that you can't have public come because you don't know how many public can come. You can't limit it. So you got to kind of be like your public access will still be this way. So we still have to do our meeting somewhat using one of these devices to get it out there um, for public comment um, and such. So, um, but, you know, us being, this being the smallest committee, the, the, you know, the six of us can sit in a room, you know, can sit in the library with plenty of feet apart and that kind of stuff. It also, when we tried it in December, it was also kind of, you know, some people were not comfortable um, attending in that fashion too. So you have to make sure that if, if, if I was Maureen, the advice I'd give her is to quietly talk to each individual, decide to make sure they're okay with coming in person. And then, you know, so you don't make anybody feel uncomfortable, whatever, or have to have someone has to be remote and then has a disadvantage in their participation due to their remote status. So that's kind of my, I'm saying that for all chairs, um, but I'd be you know, more than happy. We can even, you can do it at Waitley. You can probably set up in the gym or even or even in the cafeteria, not the cafeteria, the library even. Right, Chrissy, we can figure it out. I'm just you know, I you know, I'm just thinking if, if kids are gonna be back to school and teachers for the most part are back to school, then it's like you know, it's like having sports in a high school. And if if you're still a rule, why are you having you know sports when you you can't even have the kids back in school versus frontier. We've had kids back in school. We've been doing the sports. We've been doing it safely. I'm just thinking that, you know, as a group, whether it's just our group and maybe not frontier, that we should we should think about it or talk about it, you know, down the road. I'm the yeah, only one on to call this, though. We wouldn't be able to have it in the morning because I, I believe we're sticking with our, we're not having extra folks in the building when the kids are, are in there. So it would have to be an after school type event. So, but I, I would still, I'd still be willing to bring muffins if that helps with us. We, you know, we could, you know, maybe it's a, you know, Marie, you and I can, you can kind of do your homework on that and you and I can probably set up to have the May meeting be, um, you know, be at Waitley Elementary and we can pick an, af an afternoon to do it or evening. Um, heck, with just the five of us, we could be outside. I mean, six of us, rather, we could be outside <laughs> if we wanted to on a nice May evening. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. It, I just wanted to throw it out there. That's all. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, I think it's a good idea, Bob. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. like this. I like our little group, especially the condition I'm in right now. It's it's <laughs> perfect, but I rather you know I rather I rather be in person if we can. If just to show that hey we're in person, you know the kids are for the most part in person. The teachers are in person. You know it shouldn't it shouldn't change our committees. I understand about public comment, but we can also have something set up for public comment like we've done we've done already. So that's all. Yep. yep. It's a good point. Um, oh, Darius, when when is MCAS expected to? I know what's in the spring. Is that in April or May or Chrissy? I don't know who would have the answer. May, right, Chrissy? Yeah, it's it's usually it's usually March and April, and this year it's. April and May. And I'll be sharing once we finalize it, there's still a few details to, to figure out. But um, 
I will be sending an MCAS calendar out to families. So they're, they're cutting the length of test in half, um, basically across the board, I believe. And so there's a lot of, there's also a lot of talk out there whether or not we should test at all. Um, a lot of different opinions on that. I, you know, I think our, our schools are going to do very well in the testing because of the amount of what we have done this year in comparative to other districts and what we were able to even provide for remote students in comparative to other districts and that kind of thing. Um, I'd be curious to see where we're at on those kind of on things. Um, there's a group out there. You probably received some emails. I know they were sending out to school committees, asking school committee members not to endorse MCAS. Right now, it's a it's a mandate, you know. So, you know, I don't believe school committees cannot sign on. I think people can opt out individually, um, but um, it's still it's a federal mandate that's connected to the funding that comes from the federal government that you have to have a high stakes test. And so then it goes to the state. The state actually passed legislation that said what MCAS is. You know, uh, MCAS is not something DESE does. It actually was a state law passed. In order for them to appeal it last year and not do it, the state had to, the legislature had to vote to um, hold it for a year. So, you know, I'm just kind of saying there's more systems in place than just like, you know, people can choose, you know, um, communities can choose do it or not do it. If there's, or the state can choose to do it or not do it. There's a lot of, steps in place there. And so, um, yeah. We're talking about it a lot tonight at, at Frontier. Okay, Sarah Mitchell. The, there was one more thing that... Good. She froze. Um, am I still frozen? No, you look no, good. No, okay. Um, no, so somebody in the room and it distracted um i do believe that for the committee people who um i know beth was filling in for one year i'm not sure what her the papers are out now how to get the signature you're cutting out so, to let you guys know if uh, you want to be on the ballot for the june election Go ahead, Beth. I didn't get anything that Maureen just said. I think what Maureen was saying, if you guys can hear me, Maureen was saying that she's curious about Beth. You were you were appointed for this year, and that if, have does right. we know anything about people pulling papers to fill? Have you pulled papers to fill you, that your position? Are you running for your own position, or um, do you know of other people that are that yada yada? Oh. Um. Yes, I plan on running for my position again. Um, I don't really know how that works. I guess I would reach out to Lynn Sibley, correct? Do you guys do a caucus? Maureen? Bob, do you do you have a caucus there? Uh, no. No, it's, um, I'm not sure if I'm up or well, I'll tell you. Beth is up. Well, I'm definitely up because mine was only a six month position. Bob, okay. you're up too. So yep. both will be two positions. Bob, you're up for Wheatley. You are not up for, oh, you're you up guys, last year for Frontier. Can you guys hear me now? I switched to a different computer. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah what I was saying was that I think the um, the papers are available from the town from Lynn Sibley, you would go and pick up the papers to get your 20 signatures to have your name on the ballot for the June election. And if I remember correctly, Beth's, Beth was filling in one year for Katie, but there were two years left of her term, so she would have to run again. And I, I think last year or at the beginning of this year, Bob had said his term was going to be up at the end of this year, so he would also have to you know, get the papers and get his name on the ballot again. I'll get the papers and get the signatures and I'll get that going. I got a little extra time right now. People will give you sympathy signatures. Look at the oh, guy yeah. with his cane. He's having trouble yeah, walking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> could you could you guys hear me before that? Before Yeah, I before that was okay. fine, but the last the last thing when you started talking about taking your papers out. It just came in like every third word or whatever. So yeah, I think my last my laptop is 
at the end of life. Uh oh. Now your birthday might be coming up or something. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? We'll make a motion to adjourn there, Madam Chairman. Yeah. I have nothing else. So do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Maureen, yes. 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 Okay. The meeting is over at 504. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you.